Hi there, my name is Philip Heidson. I want to welcome you to the Art of Procurement podcast, the podcast that helps you, a forward-thinking procurement professional, position yourself and your team to proactively take advantage of the revolution that's taking place in procurement today. By interviewing industry trailblazers and sharing insights from our own experiences, my team and I pull back the curtain and shine a light on the strategies, tactics, and tools that procurement teams are using to elevate their impact. And today on the show, I welcome back Mark Pereira, the CEO at Visible, and Peter Smith, Managing Director at Procurement Excellence. In their new book, Procurement with Purpose, Peter and Mark state that the decisions we make this decade are the most important in human history. Climate change, habitat loss, and plastic waste threaten the environment. Social issues such as modern slavery, inequality, and discrimination blight the lives of millions. And so, as procurement professionals, uh, Mark and Peter state that we really have the ability to use our buying power to help address these issues and drive change around the world. But how do we do that? Well, in today's podcast, I discuss the notion of procurement with purpose with Peter and Mark and uncover what we can do to help our stakeholders make decisions that are not only good for business, but for the environment and for social causes as well. So let's go into the conversation where I ask Peter to remind us if he found procurement or if procurement found him. Uh, mainly procurement finding me. So I joined Mars Confectionery, great company, as a graduate trainee straight from university. Um, and it was a case of Mars sort of working out what I was good at and me deciding what I liked doing. Mm-hmm. And, and there was a bit of a Venn diagram there. Uh, I thought I was going to go into sales and marketing, but perhaps sales wasn't really my forte. Um, and I didn't particularly want to work shifts in the factory for too long, although I did a year. So a, a role came up, raw materials buyer role came up in purchasing and HR seemed quite keen on me applying for it. And when I went and talked to the, the head of the, uh, the function, um, I thought it sounded interesting and really yeah. thought about purchasing and procurement before. And, and in all honesty, very quickly, you know, within weeks, I thought, yeah, this is good. I really, I really enjoy the mix of analytical and interpersonal work. So um, pretty much been my home for however many years <laughs> since that all happened, really. Uh, now you're, uh, you're finding yourself uh, a prolific writer. Probably even more so from uh, from now than your time, or at least equal to your time when you were at Spend Matters, just a different format. Yeah, well, well, that was part of it. I did Spend Matters for eight years, and when I worked out how much I'd written, it was it was something crazy, like three million words, mm-hmm. literally. So I was writing two articles pretty much every day of the year, um, and I just thought, well, if I'm, I don't want to stop writing completely, but I quite like to do something that had a bit more longevity, and I wasn't going to disappear into the ether every yeah, day yeah. um so uh so yeah I, I thought i'd try and write some books and actually if you've been used to writing two articles a day writing a book is not that difficult in a sense mm. you know people think oh I, I couldn't do it all those pages all those words but if you sit down and write a few hundred words every day you, you have a book finished actually remarkably quickly I, I would say. I mean, you have to know what you're writing about, clearly. Right. You can't just write any old rubbish. Um, but um, I, I didn't find the two really I've done since Spend Matters because they were topics I, I knew a bit about and, and I felt quite strongly about. Um, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't terribly hard work, to be quite honest. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you had the discipline of writing every day. Um, Mark, how did you find yourself in procurement? Yeah, I came from a HR technology space, so that's where I, I started off, and it was uh, contingent labor solutions, so the likes of Phil Glass and IQ yeah. Navigator, which uh, kind of linked me into the world of procurement. And in uh, 2002, 2003, I kind of really found procurement as a function. And if I kind of relate it back to HR and, and maybe um, some of the other functions, uh, marketing as well, the the link up of of procurement people around the world uh, wasn't so strong. It was kind of already regional. Um, obviously, SIPs in the UK and ISM and all the other institutes, um, and that's where I you know we found I found procurement. I decided that was a, a really interesting space to go after, and um, I've been in here uh, ever since. So uh, that's that's where procurement leaders came from in terms of the first event and uh, 
we've scaled up from there. And Peter mm-hmm. was, I think, on our, our first event in uh, in Europe. Um, he was chairing the Amsterdam event yeah. at uh, the airport there in the, one of the hotels. So uh, our collaboration goes back a, a few years and really great to uh, to be working with Peter on the book. But uh, yeah, coming up to 20 years of uh, really focused on procurement and uh, ex- exciting decade or two decades ahead of me in terms right. of uh, the sustainability side coming through now as well. And so you mentioned that you both collaborated collaborated to write Procurement with Purpose. And I know it's more than just a book. You know, you've been collaborating um, on the topic of really the purpose of uh, or what procurement can drive in terms of, um, um, you know, sustainability, diversity, lots of different kind of broader topics than just procurement itself. I wonder, and I'm going to ask you, Mark, this first. You know, it seems like it's a really personal effort as well um, with the, the topics in the book. So can you talk about why it's important, why this topic of procurement with purpose is particularly important, you know, why dedicate yourself to uh, furthering the discussion around procurement with purpose? That's yeah, a great question, uh, Philip. And uh, yeah, for a personal level for me, uh, I've got two uh, teenage daughters uh, at the moment, and uh, I have to give something back uh, to to the world, I guess we can always say, but we want to leave the place in a, a better mm-hmm. better uh, position than we, we came into it. But um, yeah, I think we see it. We, you know, we're just coming off the back of COP26. Uh, we can see this from climate change, but there's so many other different agendas in there in terms of diversity, um, uh, coming through, we got forests and deforestation and all these mm-hmm. topics coming through. And when I look at my career and the network that I've built over the last coming up to 20 years, um, the ability to help organizations either take that first step or to accelerate their journey to be a more purposeful uh, organization and how they can do that with their spend, I think is just a, a huge opportunity that I couldn't miss in terms of amplifying. And um, I think, uh, yeah. I was on a beach somewhere in Mallorca and uh, Pete was somewhere else, both both thinking about this book. And uh, mm-hmm. that's where the movement of procurement and purpose really kicked off for me. And uh, the collaboration with Pete's been great. But um, we're seeing this, the interviews, and we'll, we'll talk more about the, the people we spoke to. We see the real passion for the CPOs, the leaders within the organization to make a difference and how that cascades into their the individuals in their teams and it's great. You, you, you can see the uh, the hairs on the back of people's arms prickling up as yeah. they start talking about their purpose-led programs. Very different from probably what they're talking about on the saving side of their, their agenda as well. Um, so, Peter, I guess same question to you, and then I have a follow-up. Um, you know, why is this so important for you as well, personally? Uh, well, a lot of it's the same as Mark, but I, I won't just go through that again, but... Mm-hmm. You know, I'm older than him. My daughter's older than his girls. But, you know, we share some of those same views. But I think the other thing for me is having been in procurement since the mid 80s and, and having many years involved with SIPs and so on. And all those discussions about procurement, getting a seat at the top table and that sort of stuff. And, and this a few years ago, it, it started hitting me that there were a set of issues here that really were different for procurement and had a real opportunity for us in in the profession to to sort of raise our game and get a higher profile and contribute more to our organizations at at a really strategic level. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's nothing wrong with ensuring supply and managing risk and saving money and all those great things. But I think when you're talking about bringing social value, net zero, you know, supporting minority owned firms, all all these things, it it is a different dimension for procurement. And I started talking to practitioners who were saying things like, well, you know, I've been in this organization for 20 years, and I've never presented to anyone at board level before about my my category management and my savings program. And now we've got a program where we're trying to use more social enterprises in our supply chain. And I'm getting to meet the global precedent Mm -hmm. to, to talk about what procurement is doing. So it just seemed to me it was an opportunity to both do the do the stuff about saving the planet and, and helping our our kids and so on, uh, but also do something that'd be really good for the profession and the people in it. Yeah, I, you know, I think the other part on that is the urgency. Uh, yeah. For the, um, you know, I say at least five times a day. Um, every five weeks represents one percent of the decade. So when you start thinking about that in terms of some of the goals that companies have, whether it's around greenhouse gases or forestry or water and and all these other topic areas, 
it's about getting people to move to action. I think that's what uh, yeah. you know we can see from COP26 as well. We can't just be talking about it. We just can't come up with some lovely heat maps of where the greenhouse gases are in our supply chain. It's about how we start really collaborating with them and working with the suppliers to make a difference. Um, so, yeah, what can you do in the next five weeks to make a difference? If that's reading the Procurement with Purpose book in the first instance <laughs> and then uh, taking some of the, the the key actions out of that and the key learnings and put it into practice as a step forward. But I think that's what we're keen, uh, Peter and myself, is turning this into action, not just talking about it and mm -hmm. That's why we are in the decade of our lives and we hope we can help a few companies and a few individuals in their journey. Now, now, you know, my just over the last six months, and I'm interested to see if you've seen the same, there seemed to be a marked change in the the discussions around um, purpose, you know, around whether it's social value, whether it is uh, sustainability, um, you know, more so in North America around diversity. You know, are you seeing that where we've been talking about this forever? You talked like we've been having these conversations for 20 years, but it's always been pushing the rock uphill. And now I feel like there's actually there's the board level interest in these topics and it is giving procurement the opportunity to engage. And I just wonder if just over the last six months or so, you're seeing a marked change in the role of procurement for or at least the interest in the organization to be having these kind of conversations. Yeah, we're, we're finding it. Okay, so I'll hand over to Pete in a sec. But um, from COP26, there's people now coming and saying, yeah. when is our greenhouse gas project? What are we doing? Because they are accountable ar around it. And I think it may be the first time in the last six months that um, the boards have understand the accountability of what they need to do rather than just kind of ticking a box and understanding mm -hmm. there's some sort of program there. It's now coming through. And I think what we're seeing with the new net zero standard uh, which is, you know, going to more detail of how you're getting into the plan that is including the whole supply chain. And you need to show your near term and long term uh, goals and commitments to get to net zero. It changes the dial again. But um, again, this is also on the supplier diversity and the other topic areas. Um, I think we're seeing it going beyond North America in terms of supplier mm -hmm. diversity and now coming to, to Europe. And we're seeing companies you know, pledging how much money is going to be shifting from the old to the new in terms of right. diversity spent. So I think we're seeing it every day from my conversations. And, you know, we're we're seeing it visible where we talk about supplier collaboration, where it was probably a little bit more towards innovation and growth uh, and maybe the uh, performance-based side of SRM in the past. Yeah, I think 100% of our conversations are now around uh, the sustainability and the, the mm -hmm. social value side is on it. I, th I think I think possibly COVID has made a lot of people think a bit more about the meaning of life and um, the, you know our links with the natural world and uh, what what might have started with bats and and all that sort of thing. Um, so I, I think that's one factor. I think the other thing is that there's there's a number of stakeholders driving this. For most organisations, they've got their customers, they've got their own staff. They've got governments and regulators, and we, we write about all this in the book, uh, and even investors. And I think we're getting to that sort of perfect storm point where all those different stakeholders are pushing organizations harder. So when it was only one um, one group maybe making a bit of a fuss, organizations could sort of push back. But now mm -hmm. they're being told by their investors they have to do it, or yeah. maybe even their cost of capital is going to go up if they don't do it. They're being told by governments, there's new regulations. Their own staff are going, why are we using all this crappy plastic that's killing the turtles in the ocean? Mm -hmm. um, so, so you know, I think just the pressure from the different groups of stakeholders has got to the point where boards are, are saying, okay, now we really have to do something. I think we're also seeing it in job titles. Uh, I guess there must be some clever piece of technology that we probably can put across LinkedIn. Uh, if you look at the number of CPOs who are now taking sustainability as a joint role mm -hmm. um, and the number of procurement people who now have sustainability in their title and actually in their responsibility, I think that shows where the shift to focus has come through. And I guess we can do that from a more quantifiable uh, data set as well. But we're, we're definitely seeing that come through. And I think... Uh, the other thing is just purpose. I think there's a more authentic purpose than something which was more generic around sustainability in the past. And we see that on the front page of every large corporate website now. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, and and the, the numbers are crazy. You know, 80% of your greenhouse gases in most organization will come outside of your own organization. So right. in scope, scope three. So I think this is where procurement really comes to the table. And, and as Pete alluded to, I think this is where procurement will take a board seat in terms of the sustainability um, side, but also the environmental and uh, an ethical side in the future. Um, companies are going to have to be good actors within the uh, the global uh, framework, and I think it's it's the time coming through. And uh, as we say, how does that spend make a real impact and difference? I think procurement have got a big role to play in that in the the future corporate environment. Yeah, and, and you know when you talk about investors um, demanding um, more of a focus, then that ultimately is going to impact shareholder value. It's impacting brand value. It's it's not a matter of well, what's the ROI of buying X versus buying Y. And um, you know, actually, I, I don't want to go down the road of well, it might be more expensive because actually, it can be really innovative and it can be cheaper um, to be more sustainable. But it's a it's a bigger organizational decision than am I going to buy A or buying B, um, which I think takes us out of the mindset of traditionally how we've looked at and had conversations with our stakeholders. Um, uh, Peter, yeah. Yeah, you just pick up on that. It's a great point because I think it does it does lead us to stressing one thing, which is although Mark's right, you know, procurement is taking more of a lead on this. This isn't a topic that can sit purely within the procurement department. Yeah. Uh, and I think when you talk to practitioners, you know, there will be some tough decisions and hard work needed down the track. And, and they are organisational decisions and their collaborative work within the organisation and outside. So, you know, it's procurement taking a lead and being a facilitator and, and being a leader gen- genuinely. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not something we can sort of do by ourselves. And, and, and the budget holders are going to have to be involved because there may or may not be a cost or there may be a cost, but you're going to get great benefits back in mm-hmm. other ways. But but these aren't purely procurement decisions. I think that came out strongly in the interviews we, we did. Um, now, you interviewed a lot of uh, procurement executives. You alluded to it there in the book. What are some of the things, and, and a lot of these executives you talk to are really going above and beyond um, kind of the traditional role of procurement when it comes to sustainability, for example. Um, what are some of the things that you learned from those conversations um, that you know that procurement can do the actions that procurement can take, um, and I'll I'll ask that first of all I'll ask that Peter to you. Um, I think it's it's getting involved in some of those sort of two things long term collaboration and innovation with suppliers. Mm-hmm. So if you talk to people like like Unilever or, or Heineken, you know consumer goods companies. Some of the work they're doing with with packaging suppliers, say, I I was head of packaging buying at Mars many, many years ago. And we we didn't, in all honesty, think too much about uh, whether our packaging was recyclable or compostable or anything else. Whereas now now it would be right at the top of my priority list in that role. So some of the work that those companies are doing with suppliers that's got a five or 10 year time frame, really trying to come up with innovative technical solutions. And then I think I think the other thing is some of the interesting work that actually um, sectors are collaborating. So actually competitors are, are collaborating. Mm-hmm. So again, going going back to my Mars days, the work that a number of chocolate and confectionery companies are doing, working together to try and improve the conditions uh, and the economic situation of subsistence farmers in the Ivory Coast or Malaysia. Um, because, you know... It's in the best interests of Mars and Cadbury's and Nestle that those people succeed and, and do well. And, and, you know, a couple of pence on the price of some cocoa beans doesn't matter if you have a, a more resilient and stronger supply chain because mm-hmm. the people at the bottom are, are doing a bit better themselves. So so really some quite quite sort of inspiring stuff there. I'm sure Mark, Mark will have a few other examples from our interviews. Yeah, I think it's really interesting speaking to uh, Stephanie Smith and um, Dave Ingram from Unilever, um, and particularly the program that Peter, who runs their home care divisions, running there, which is the the Clean Future uh, program. So they're looking to v- remove non-virgin plastic mm-hmm. from all their home care um, products by 2030. I think is the the goal there. So I, the interesting part is that it forces you to uh, 10x your thinking. It's not just a an incremental 10% improvement, um, but also makes you look at those categories of spend or, or product 
uh, that's coming through and how you transform those supplier markets. So I never realized there's more plastic in a, a bottle of cleaning product than the bottle themselves. Um, right. And, uh, you know, they're all sourced, the, the carbon sourced by, uh, I guess, going back to, to oil uh, as a source of that in, in most instances. Um, so we've seen really some really interesting uh, collaborations there with Unilever and Avonic around how you can get these uh, the carbon from from different sources for surfactants. So obviously that's mm-hmm. the main thing in a cleaning product is the the part that's going to clean it. So major transformation, adopting new technologies, but understanding that some categories are really transformational when you look at the impact to your business, but also the scarcity of uh, kind of decarbonized solutions in there. Yeah. So I think they're the, the big transformations we're, we're seeing on that side. Um, and also, we you know, we interviewed Mark Smith from BP. So, um, you know, a company who's at the, the, I guess, been in the heart of fossil fuels uh, mm-hmm. for the years. Now, you know, huge trans- transformation and change from the new CEO and really leaning on a transformation of the organization uh, away from their old business model to to new and there as well. So um, it was great to speak to to so many individuals who have got passion on that side. The likes of Ninian Wilson from Vodafone, uh, mm-hmm. who's actually been looking and, and running the diversity program internally for for several years, and now as you know, bring that into the supplier base as well. Um, and looking at there's lots of different levers that companies are looking at. So. I think we're seeing that um, Ninian's put in that place where they will be looking uh, on RFPs or sourcing activities at the sustainability scoring coming through. So it is mm-hmm. affecting where the spend comes through as well as you know reviewing customers on their sustainability um, framework. So we're seeing uh, companies take different routes on it. Um, and not many companies are doing it in the same way because they're, right. they're looking at different parts of the, the agenda. But um, I think the passion around it has been the common theme and how it makes people feel. But obviously, that uh, the part comes through. I think the other thing is there's a great book by Andreessen, one of the uh, founders of Andreessen Horowitz, the big yeah. uh, venture capital company, called "The Hard Things About Hard Things." Yeah, ben this Horowitz, is not an easy. Yeah, Horowitz, it is. Yeah, it, it's not an easy thing of what we're trying to do here in terms of these different agendas you know you look at supply diversity in the us you actually have a good data set around this uh, in europe there's there's no data set so it's an emerging part of how do we benchmark our di- diversity of our suppliers um, and then start shifting our spend across um, also then you look at what does diversity mean is that the ownership of the business is it the leadership of the business or is it the team who's sitting opposite you mm-hmm. across the desk every day when you're working together and collaborating so a lot of these standards need to be formed still as well so uh, this is the hard thing about hard things all these different agendas coming through so um, it's going to make a lot of people uncomfortable not knowing how they're going to hit these numbers um, and maybe even understand what the numbers are when we haven't got standards around some of the things we're looking to affect and change. There were a couple of people we spoke to who um, who told us that so, some of the things they're they're looking at are really out on the on the edge of of stuff that just sounds almost incredible. So it's quite mm-hmm. interesting that you know when they're trying to think about some of these agendas like net zero, it's really making them think creatively to the point that they wouldn't actually let us write about them in the end right. because they said it was either you know competitive advantage in yeah. 10 years time or or just it would make them sound like like they were mad mm-hmm. um, but uh, but actually it's just it just shows how some of this is is stimulating some really creative exciting thinking in organizations do you find that there's a, as much a focus on the indirect um, side of procurement than the direct or is the focus more on product when you well, in think, the interviews you've done, yeah, I, I think probably when you're looking at, at, at emissions and net zero, um, there's probably more focus on direct and and obviously buying energy and transportation yeah. and some of those things. Um, but some of the other agendas, when you look at diversity and inclusion, supporting minorities, helping people with disabilities get into the workforce, you know, there's a whole range of other issues there where indirects can be can be at least as powerful. So if you're, if you're spending a lot on legal services or management consulting, then what are your suppliers in those areas doing? Mm-hmm. I, I mean, both in terms of emissions, but also in terms of things like, like diversity, um, supporting disadvantaged people and communities, um, 
paying fair wages down through their supply chains because you know they're employing cleaners and caterers and security people and uh, lots of different firms themselves so uh, I think there's a different focus on on the different purpose topics if you like mm. between direct and indirect but the agenda's there for for everybody one of the interesting thing, things that comes out, whether it's direct or indirect, is uh, how often are people going to jump on a plane and, and meet their customer or meet their supplier because <laughs> mm -hmm. of the uh, the greenhouse gas emissions that come come on that side as well. It's you, uh, you know the the double whammy of of, of COVID plus that. I was at the uh, the GBTA conference, which is. Um, the Global Business Travel Association here in the States, the largest kind of industry group for business travel over here in the US. And they were doing a, you know, getting back to travel kind of conference, which fortunately was in my backyard here in Orlando. So it was just a quick drive to it. Um, but, you know, there's there's so much unknown about travel right now. And, you know, the expectation that when travel returns, it is really just what's business critical. A lot of the things that we traveled for in the past that were non-business critical you know, how quickly are those really going to come back? Um, it's, and that's uh, both from a, a duty of care perspective, so from a health, but also I was really surprised at the amount of organizations there that were talking seriously about sustainability and sustainability impact on travel. It's, yeah, um, think... just, just, just before we, we had this conversation, um, sounds like I'm boasting, but I, I got a phone call from a journalist at the BBC mm -hmm. who, who wanted to interview me about... Um, some, something that happened during pandemic procurement, you know, government procurement. We've all read about that. Uh, and I said, yeah, sure, fine. I've done a few interviews in the last 18 months or so. Um, and he said, well, when can you make it? I said, well, well, any time, you know, tonight, tomorrow morning, whatever. He said, well, we want you to come into the studio. And I, and I sort of recoiled. It was, mm -hmm. oh, I, I assumed we'd be doing this on Zoom. No, no, no. We think we'd like to do it in person. And, and I just thought, how my attitudes changed in the last 18 months. Yeah. It, that was a real, honestly, a shock to the system. And it was, oh, I don't know whether I want to go into London and sit in a studio and all, all of that sort of thing. So, yeah, we've um, psychologically, it's, it's changed things quite a lot, I think. Yeah, I think there's, a, uh, there's an interesting, we spoke to Thomas Uderson from Bayer. Mm -hmm. And um, Traditionally, Bay have done these large supply days talking about their, their growth and sustainability, uh, I guess, topic areas. Uh, this year, uh, he did a virtual supplier day. So I think they had about 2,000 suppliers right. coming coming in and um, and no no travel on carbon, if that makes sense, because people mm -hmm. were dining in both from Bayer and from the suppliers. I think they, they saved about 450 tonnes of carbon in the process. So it's an interesting one on how companies are going to justify doing physical supply days right. in the future when they're probably going to be talking to their suppliers <laughs> about reducing their carbon emissions mm -hmm. at the same time. Why are you so, all in here to talk about it? Yeah, and you're part of our scope three that we right. want you to re reduce as well. So it's an interesting side of that. And I think, you know, that comes into diversity. So you could get more diverse suppliers as in smaller and and all, all the kind of colors of, of diversity at the event by not just doing it with your top yeah. 100 or 200. So I think it also leans into to multiple topic areas in terms of how people have to rethink about how they communicate, but also how they collaborate as well. Mm -hmm. So I think COVID is probably uh, changing changing the way we communicate and, uh, and collaborate and, and meet and, and share our strategies with our suppliers as well. Now you talked a little bit before about um, companies within industries collaborating with each other because we're trying to solve industry broad um, problems. Um, do you see corporations or private businesses actually interacting with NGOs, you know, interacting with governments uh, or regulatory, regulatory entities as we kind of collectively think more about the impact that we can have um, you know, around sustainability, for example? Do you see that happening? Or is it most like every business is kind of doing it on their own right now? I think, again, we're seeing those collaborations within industries, whether it's NGOs or, or groups coming through. Um, we uh, we heard from Emir Sassi, um, who's the head of sustainability sourcing at uh, Novartis the other day. Mm. Um, there's a really good program that came. I think they launched it at COP26, actually, um, with Schneider Electric. So uh, a whole group of the pharma companies came together and said, right, we need to address scope three and the low hanging fruit on scope three is is energy so they they teamed up with schneider electric it's called the energize program 
um, and they're teaching their suppliers about energy. And obviously, yeah. I think Snyder Electric can offer um, kind of the services around that. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, if that happens to your first tier suppliers and then they cascade it into their second and third tier suppliers, then, you know, there's a reasonable impact that can happen on scope three of moving to renewable energy across your suppliers quickly. So I think we are seeing that, you know, there's a group within the uh, FMCG space as well uh, who have come together. I think the team over at Ecobardis involved in, in that mm-hmm. one as well. So I think we're seeing those cross industry ones uh, come in. I'm not sure about government side, Peter, if you've seen I, some. Yeah, I think, I mean, there is collaboration without a doubt. I, I think the one thing I would say is that I think a lot of big companies actually have a longer term perspective than governments and politicians. Yeah. And that's true. I mean, I interviewed actually an old university friend of mine for the book, um, who's now sort of semi retired from working in a very, very big bank for many years at a very senior level. And he's now chairman of of that pension fund, Mm -hmm. which has hundreds of billions in it. And he sits on the board of two other pension funds. And um, he said, well, my perspective is, is, 80 years or so, because a 20 year old joining these companies now may still be drawing a pension when they're 100. Yeah. So, you know, he's looking at investment decisions and who he gives mandates to on that basis. And, and Unilever or BP or, or Heineken or Vodafone will be looking at existing in 50 or 100 years time. So I think big firms will work with governments, but they also want to try and develop their own momentum either alone or in collaboration with other firms because they know you might get a, a trump comes along and for four years you yeah. have to change you have to tack a bit a... Mm-hmm. and hopefully things get better again if you're working in the developing world maybe there's a you know there's a coup in whatever country you're in and you have to find a way of working through that but but the big companies are taking quite a long-term perspective which which i think is good for for all of us really now you know i alluded earlier to the fact that you you know, sometimes it's going to cost more to have, um, you know, make more purpose-driven decisions. Sometimes it costs less. So I don't want to say every time it's going to be more, but I want to talk a little bit about when it does cost more to make decisions around um, purpose. You wrote, uh, you gave an example in the book of a firm that says, basically, we're prepared to spend up to 5% more to support a, a purpose-driven firm. You know, I wonder who is it that kind of makes that decision who is it that is info because you know when we're working with stakeholders on a stakeholder level yeah. we're probably gonna get pushback because it's their budget so where are those decisions set within an organization well I, well i think that has to come from the from the top and i mean the organizations that are really showing leadership in this they all have top level leadership that's behind it mm-hmm. uh, but as i said earlier i mean procurement has to work with its stakeholders and that includes budget holders and, and we we can't make those decisions on our own um and there has to be a business case for it it might be a it might not be a business case that's sort of hard in the sense of the accountants looking at it and going yeah i, I can see the numbers add up but um but ultimately you know the business case will be we'll find it better easier to recruit good people We'll have a better image in the customer's eyes. Our cost of capital will come down eventually. And those things make it worthwhile, possibly spending a bit more or investing in, in some areas. Um, but I mean, there's also a lot of areas where, where it shouldn't cost money. I, right. I don't think generally. In, in fact, I, I would suggest that if you're a company that where the vast majority of your suppliers are the, the big firms that are the market leaders in, in those categories, uh, you probably save money by looking a bit at uh, broadening your supply base and bringing Mm -hmm. in some different firms and smaller firms and so on. Um, But, but, you know, there ultimately, there has to be some business case, even if it isn't absolutely numbers driven. Uh, And and that means procurement does need support from other stakeholders and from the the top of the organization, without a doubt. Now, do you see, um, and I'll ask this to you, Mark, do you see when you were going through your interviews, any procurement groups that were actually working with sales to say, well, if we want to have more purpose-driven input, if you will, into these products, it's going to be more expensive. Testing the market to see if that's a, an additional cost the market is willing to bear. Um, do you see any of that connection, or is that thinking maybe a little bit further ahead? I think some of those teams are so purpose-driven. Uh, and again, I don't want to go back to Unilever each time, but they know 
where the puck is going in terms of consumer uh, behavior mm-hmm. to towards it. So they've made a decision that they each of their brands has got a purpose behind it. So they've yeah. decided that they're going to lean in on on carbon, on diversity, on all these different topic areas, and that's going to be part of their products. That's their differentiation differentiation in the market, uh, and each brand will have a, a purpose behind it. So that may mean they are a premium brand because they. Uh, mm-hmm. those ones in there so i think it is a, a part of that but i think the the headwind behind uh, organizations are having this in their products and their services that there, there's kind of no it, it's part of the part of the journey of a, a corporate as well and, and the cfos and the investors are all over it as well i mean again if you really look at um let's say take the carbon side because it's a nice and easy low-hanging fruit one um is that product actually cheaper when you start putting the carbon credits that you're going to have to pay in the future? Mm-hmm. So we're now seeing a lot more corporates uh, coming up with the price of carbon internally and selling that. We saw that with Volvo uh, in the last couple of weeks off the back of COP26. Um, and we're seeing the true price is the price you're going to pay. And we talk about total costs. The total cost now includes the future uh, carbon uh, that you're going to have to pay on it as well. And that's where we're seeing some of the demand change coming through. Mm -hmm. So the internal stakeholders have to make the decision uh, as well. So I think we're seeing that uh, coming through. Um, So companies are making a decision on that. I think there's some interesting link-ups as well. We interviewed Paul from GiveWith. I'm not sure if you've had him on the the podcast before. we have uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah, and he, you know it's really interesting the proposition that they have, which is the the, the win win for the buying company as well as the sales organization around some mm-hmm. of these social impact programs that come through, and the I guess the the financial impact of the positive sides in of both sides on that coming through. So I think there's ways of making it uh, numeric in terms of the part coming through, and I think there is the link between sales and yeah. procurement coming through because it's two sides of the same coin in terms of. Right. You are telling your customers that you're, you know, doing the diversity and so forth, mm-hmm. and then you're putting it in place. So I think the two are starting to connect a lot more. I, I haven't seen so much in terms of direct, but it's it's clearly happening now. I think it's definitely happening amongst firms that are big suppliers to government, because because government's asking them those questions and, mm-hmm. and they're actually in the tender documents and and they're often scored now. So I I know there are salespeople for. You know whether it's defence firms or business process outsourcing or technology firms that are putting in for big government contracts, and their salespeople are going to their procurement people and saying, "Hey, we've got to write a thousand words about how we're encouraging diversity in our supply chain, and we're going to get a score for that." So, yeah. give me give me some content here. Um, so I think that's building in, in those sort of businesses. That's definitely building links between between sales and procurement, which is great. Yeah, you know, purely you in the tech. That, sorry, go ahead, Mark. Purely in the tech world, uh, Phil. For that, what we're seeing is companies now. You know, we we've, we've committed to our science uh, science based targets. Uh, we've not stood science based targets, but too small for that. Um, we've committed to our, our net zero uh, mm-hmm. program by twenty thirty. Okay, so we're a relatively small fish in uh, in the world of software uh, today. Hopefully, in ten years' time, we'll be one in big fish. But. Um, uh, how do we make it easy for smaller companies to make those commitments as well and take the journey? Because it is down to everyone in the supply chain and it's important right. for them to to put it forward. So yes, you need all your ISOs, but you need to be showing that you're on, you know, you have a plan to get to net zero and you have a plan around diversity internally, but also with your suppliers. So I think it, it comes into all organizations. I would say if you're a CEO of a company of any size, you will be talking to your customers or consumers about your ESG agenda within the business. Yeah. So I think it comes into all companies, and I, I think it's very few businesses that aren't going to get touched by this. Um, now, what I was going to say as a follow up is that you know it's good to hear that you're responding to you know to tenders with the information about your commitments from a net zero perspective. Peter, you said about uh, you know in government tenders, there's a lot of requests for information about you know we we got to fill these thousand words. Um, how as a because immediately it came it, I thought well that's one of the things that we can do as a buyer is we can start asking those questions so then that led me to as a buyer and somebody responds to that question how can we actually ascertain that there's meaning behind the words and that it isn't you know kind of the continuation of marketing fluff or hype or like how can we dig deeper to see if that's truly uh, if how somebody responds is truly in keeping yeah. with how their organization thinks. 
I think that's one of the most fundamental challenges and questions for mm. us. And, um, you know, I, I've heard that a lot, um, public sector and private sector, where, where companies are starting to ask their suppliers those things, either in the formal tender process or outside it. Yeah. They're even sometimes building clauses into the contracts around these issues. But then you ask the question, well, how are you actually checking, verifying, how are you doing the contract management, or the supplier relationship management, whatever. Uh, and that's often the, the, the weak spot, to, to be honest, because mm -hmm. it is difficult. So I think we've got quite a lot to do there. I think technology will help. I think we need more standards, um, clearer reporting, you know, agreement about what we want companies to report. And, and also we can't have a situation where every customer is asking a supplier for slightly different information and data and, yeah. and you know you end up with thousands of people it's like you need to stand like you need standardized questions yeah. for infra security you need standardized questions yeah. for uh, um sustainability for example we, we do and and technology platforms where people can basically do the work once yeah and then disseminate that around their their uh, customer base or to government or whoever wants to see it um so I think I think there's a lot to be done there, and and you know people can't afford to go out and visit every supplier great regularity, but there's a role for actual um, looking people in the in the eyes and visiting factories and premises and seeing what's going on, um, which we used to do back back in the olden days at Mars. Right. That was a key Mars principle. We probably did it more than any of our competitors actually. And I think it's still a good principle, but but we, we're going to need some clever solutions, I think, to to make that better because it's mm. not we're a long way away from perfection in that space. Yeah, I think standards are the key, but um, that does come with a little bit of custom frameworks on top. So again, I, I'm very much into decarbonisation. I'm, I'm uh, talking about nonstop, but um, if you look at that, CDP is the the source of truth for uh, carbon at the moment in terms of mm. the the questionnaire that comes through, and then. Um, within each of those sections, there'll be some sort of standard that the companies are, are recording against that. But that's fine at a company level that we know that this supplier is um, both disclosing and it's gone all the way up to, and they've got a level A that the leadership are completely engaged with that. But then when you start saying, all right, well, we manufacture at three different plants around the world, that's where it really goes into your scope three because we need right. to know, you know how efficient you are from a, an energy side and the carbon emissions from those three out of 50 different manufacturing plants the supplier has as well so the standards come in um, and it's great to get those standards in but we'll have to have some custom frameworks and questions that will allow companies to take to the next level but mm -hmm. i think that's why we're seeing companies getting in the the likes of eco artists give a, a good overall score for companies mm -hmm. and then they're going deeper to, deeper in, in elements there but we have to not look for the perfect solution today. Yeah. Um, and I think this is where we have to build up the momentum. I'm a gla half glass, glass half full uh, type of person. So mm -hmm. I'm more on the opt uh, optimist in saying that, right, they're disclosing the information. They have a plan against this. Yeah. Now we have standards in terms of reporting, and then we can monitor that uh, over a period of time on the improvements that it will go in the right direction to hit these targets as well. But I think we have to start with that and, and go through and yeah, more standards will come in, more audit around that as well. But um, again, we have to, I think we have to go with the optimism of what people are telling us in the first instance and then how do we scrutinize a little bit more as we go along? I think, I think one point we do have to be careful is a bit of a, a sort of dilemma here because if we're not careful, we'll introduce lots of new barriers to entry for suppliers because we'll require them to, to do all these things and tick all these boxes and fill in these forms and get lots of accreditations that cost lots of money. And that will end up making it harder for the, the smaller firms, the minority-owned firms, the disadvantaged firms, you know, all, which, which are, with the one hand, we're desperately trying to encourage them into our supply chain. And then we're making it really difficult for them to get into our supply chain. Uh, and that's coming up quite a bit in, in the public sector again, because government is asking more and more you're getting to the point where pre-qualification documents are you know 20 30 40 pages long mm -hmm. and the small supplier is going to look at them and say i haven't got time to yep. fill in all these things and yep. tell the government every detail of my diversity plan and my net zero plan and my plan for employing apprentices and you know i just won't bother supplying government and then it'll be back to 
to just the big firms being able yeah. to do that. I think that's one area, actually. And Peter, you're probably closer to the people in the in the government. Um, and Phil, Philippe, it would be good to get your view on it. Is how does government help the com- uh, c- companies within their own uh, region in learning about these topic areas and improving mm-hmm. it? So, you know, the UK wants to be the the greenest, the best at everything. Um, all right. Well, how are we educating the companies? large and small to doing that now they put in the rules i think it's the FTSE 250 and the financial services all have to have science-based targets and doing the carbon side what about the other x percentage of companies across you know the the startup all the way through how does the uk really start doing grassroots on sustainability diversity coming through and help the companies so educating them what is carbon Mm -hmm. You know, you go to 95% of the uh, companies in the UK and ask them what car- carbon is and how they'll get to net zero. It's a really hard task for them. So this is where governments could come in and sweeping kind of support. Um, and I think this may be where countries, not that this should be a global competition because uh, it doesn't make a difference if the UK are leaders, if the rest of the world aren't on the yeah. journey with us. But how do we educate people? And I think that's one thing that we could really do. The governments can get in view view is educating companies around these different topic areas um, and I think that's where we're seeing corporates take a lead on this as well because mm-hmm. it's part of their scope three uh, within a CDP report in section 12 which was one of my favorite sections which is where you're talking about what you do with your suppliers is a whole section on education so how are you educating suppliers about carbon how are you you know getting them to, to the point of disclosure um, so we're going to see corporates doing this uh, with their suppliers and uh, as well but I think this is where you know the governments of the world can come in and really educate on this as well. Yeah, I feel like there um, there has to be some kind of incentive structure. So whether it's tax credits or because you know for smaller businesses there's a, a there's so many things to focus on. You know how do you how do you focus on the thing that's most important? Well, if there's some financial benefit for you to become more educated, even in understanding what this can mean for your business and starting reporting on it, then you know, there's a reason for you to do that versus, you know, get on the next sales call, for example. Uh, so I do think that there has to be, in some way, it has to be, um, you know, government-led, but that's for the smaller businesses. Um, you know, I think what you're seeing, and we've seen over the last four or five years here in the States, is this, like, divergence between government and corporate. So now corporate is realizing that they have to take action. They're kind of not waiting for the government to tell them what to do. But for those smaller businesses, I wonder if it's it still needs to have some kind of incentive structure. I'm signed up, uh, Philip and, and Peter. If you can make it happen uh, in the UK, I think we have 20, 20% on corporate tax. Mm-hmm. If you've got Z- net zero, which has been audited, let's get it down to 16%. I wonder right. if that would speed up large corporates for making a change more quickly. I, I think it think. probably would. I'm sure it would. I'm sure um, it would. Well, I know it's about time to to wrap up. I have one last question um, just for both of you to answer before uh, I finally wrap up. And you talked at the beginning about you wanted the book to be about actions. You know, what can we start to do to actually take action uh, around um, procurement with purpose? So if there's one action that you, you know, you, you recommend in the book, you, there's a procurement leader that hasn't really started on their journey yet. What would you recommend? Where would they start? And I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to ask that first to you, Peter. Put you on the spot. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's it's a bit of a boring answer, really. Mark can think of something snappier, maybe. But um, I, I mean, I think you have to start by thinking about what your strategy is going to be. If you really, you know, if you really haven't started on that that journey, mm-hmm. and that means working out where you can make a difference. Yeah. Um, and, and is it to focus on on net zero? Uh, obviously, you've got to do the stuff that's regulatory and, and you know where you have no choice. Um, but think about that strategy. Where can you make a difference? What do your stakeholders care about? And where can you actually have an impact? Um, and you know, read the book. It take you through that process, mm-hmm. and then and then socialize that with your senior colleagues. So put the case to them for why you should start a a diverse supplier program, uh, why you should be doing more to look at where your your, um, your raw materials are coming from in terms of mm-hmm. deforestation and, and so on, uh, why you need to put the focus on, on packaging materials. So, you know, if you really haven't started, think carefully about where you, you can really make a difference because we haven't said this yet, I don't think, but even Unilever and people like that 
have recognized they can't do everything. Mm-hmm. If you look at the whole universe of everything Unilever could be doing in the procurement with purpose space, they're not doing everything because nobody can. So you do have to you do have to focus. Uh, and, and if you do that and work out strategically where you're going, then whatever area you're looking at, you'll find some quick wins. And, you know, I'd always recommend a blend of long term strategy, know what, what you're aiming for, but get some quick wins along the way. I mean, that's just good change management, frankly, whether we're talking purpose or anything else. Yeah, um, I'll go for a little bit more extreme on this one. Uh, firstly, I would get, uh, I'll go onto the science-based target website and look at your the science-based target that your company's done. Uh, for the more extreme ones, I would get a semi-permanent tattoo done or what that science-based <laughs> target is on the back of your hand. For those who, who don't want to go doing on a semi-permanent uh, <laughs> basis, uh, maybe a large post-it note that sits above your uh, laptop screen uh, of of that science based target, and as every five weeks represents one percent of the decade, I would go on to the science based targets uh, every day, and yep. for every day over the next five weeks, look at your top thirty five suppliers, and read their science based targets, and put that on mm-hmm. another post it note, and put them all over your wall, and get a little uh, those little dots that you have on there maybe picking out different colors to represent different parts of your science-based targets and how many of your suppliers are aligned to that. I think you'll learn a huge amount about your suppliers. I guess your top 25 suppliers in any company is going to represent a reasonable amount of spend for you and a reasonable amount of impact. But just doing that and then grouping them together on your, your wall in your office, I think it'd be really valuable to understand if we are as good as the five, 10 people we spend the most time with, mm-hmm. I guess as a corporate, you're as good as the top 35 companies that you spend yeah. your money with. So I'll take that action over the next five weeks. And you could even do that for the 12 days of Christmas as you well. You get, get the, the names of the top 25 suppliers all tattooed on your, on your forehead or something. That would, that would work. <laughs> wow. Would be, that that, would that's be a good that's really interesting. We'll see. If we see Peter next, uh, next yeah, time with I'm, tattoos I'm all over his video. body, <laughs> we know he's been drinking too much of that lovely red wine and <laughs> gone down to the tattoo, uh, parlor and, and done that but uh, <laughs> yeah i think that's it i think there's small things you can do and if you think about every category manager if yeah. you're a cpo and listening to this about doing exactly the same thing look at the top 35 suppliers in the next five five weeks get your category managers to do the same thing read their science-based targets and the ones who haven't got science-based targets or well, maybe we should be having a, a conversation with them about why we need to put some science-based targets and explaining what are purposes what we're trying to achieve and, and mm-hmm. see how they can align that in your next qbr meeting as well all right well i want to thank you very much for your time i want to remind everybody who's listening please do go pick up the book learn a little bit more about uh, procurement with purpose but also what you can do and how you can lead your organizations to think differently about the things that you buy uh, i imagine that's available at all all places all good bookstores as they say um in in person and um um online so uh check that out we'll put a link in the show notes as well for everyone to go and check that out on amazon so uh peter mark i want to thank you so much for joining us today if this episode struck a chord with you please do send it to somebody we grow here at art of procurement through word of mouth and that would be really appreciated You can also support us by giving us a thumbs up, a star rating, or a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Since 2015, we've built the world's largest free resource for procurement professionals looking to elevate their impact. Our resources span podcasts like this, videos, blog posts, papers, and events. To join us on the inside and to ensure you never miss an episode, a webinar, an event, or a post, please do subscribe to our weekly newsletter this week in procurement. You can do that at artofprocurement.com slash subscribe. That's artofprocurement.com slash subscribe. Thank you for joining us today and I look forward to seeing you again soon.